Right now on Morning News Now, disorder in the court, a tense exchange between a New York judge and Donald Trump in the former president's criminal hush money trial. The judge should not be there. The judge is highly conflicted. He should not be there. What led up to the drama as seven jurors are now seated for the trial? And from the courtroom to the campaign trail, how President Biden is working to win over voters in Battleground, Pennsylvania. And it's not if, but when. The world bracing for Israel's planned retaliation following Iran's aerial assault over the weekend. We'll bring you the latest as fears of a wider war grow. Plus the crisis in the Middle East causing controversy here at home by the valedictorian of a major university says she's being silenced over her stance on the war. Plus, federal officials sounding the alarm over a counterfeit Botox that's caused several hospitalizations. What doctors want to make sure you know. And the Paris Olympics now just 100 days away with some of the world's best athletes going for gold. We'll sit down with weightlifter Hampton Morris about what it's like to represent Team USA. Some 100 days out, so exciting. Good morning, I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for joining us this Wednesday. Joe is off this morning, so you're stuck with me. We're gonna get started this morning right here in New York, where the first seven jurors have now been selected in former President Trump's hush money trial. Those jurors will return to court next week. Court is not in session on Wednesday, so jury selection will continue on Thursday. The judge presiding over the case warned the former president not to intimidate potential jurors after lawyers poured over old social media posts from those potential jurors. Trump is accused of falsifying business records to cover up alleged hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels during the 2016 election. He's pleaded not guilty to the charges. After court ended yesterday, Trump visited a Manhattan bodega and talked about the case. If you look and you take a look around, a good strong look, every legal scholar, every legal pundit said there should be no trial. This is not, there was nothing done wrong. This is all politics. This is coming out of the White House. And, you know, it makes me campaign locally, and that's okay. NBC News senior national politi political reporter Jonathan Allen has been down at the courthouse, but now he joins us in studio, and we're all so thrilled to have you here at 30 Rock with us, Jonathan. Uh, what did you do to Joe? <laughs> <laughs> It's just me. I heard you were coming to town, and I said, get out of here. Um, good morning. Thank you very much for being here. We really are happy to have you with us on set. So tell us, it was a pretty eventful day. I understand there was even at one point it seemed the former president said something sort of in the direction or directed at a potential juror. Walk us through what happened yesterday. Yeah, by far the most dramatic moment as the one that you were just talking about, but if you sort of uh, zoom back, what we got yesterday was the selection of seven jurors. Uh, overall, there will be 12 jurors, and uh, Judge Marchand says... Uh, perhaps as many as six alternatives. So they're still trying to go through the, uh, what they call the voir dire process, the jury selection process, uh, where the attorneys get to ask uh, prospective jurors questions and uh, determine whether or not they want to ask the judge to strike those jurors or use what are called uh, peremptory challenges to, uh, to get rid of the ones who they think might not be able to be fair. Um, and in terms of that moment, yeah. super dramatic. A woman had been brought back in uh, to be questioned about some social media posts. And according to the judge, we could not see this on the, on the video feed uh, from the closed circuit inside. Uh, but according to the judge, while the woman was uh, on the stand um, or, or being interviewed, uh, Donald Trump made a gesture and uh, and muttered toward her, and the judge came back and said uh, he would not tolerate anything that uh, smacked of intimidation. Uh, he se seemed pretty agitated about it. Mm. Um, our Von Hilliard interviewed a potential juror after, outside of the courthouse after they were dismissed. Let's listen to some of that, and we'll talk on the other side. It was a really fascinating contrast between feeling that gravity of... Not only is, is someone's fate kind of in our hands here, but the fate of parts of our country's legal system going forward is kind of in our hands because this is unprecedented. So, of course, it is a tall task. And I think as you start to find out if you're, I mean, I just was in jury duty in probably the same room like two weeks ago. And so I'm just imagining, you know, mine was very uneventful. We didn't even get to the point of being discussed in a case whatsoever. All of a sudden you recognize what you're actually there for. It is this big moment. What do we know about the seven jurors who so far have kind of passed that threshold? And what do we think about the timeline on this process since we did end up getting seven just in the one day? So you were on assignment 
Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> the New York Recon, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what we know about these seven jurors, we don't know a ton about them. Uh, obviously, they are people who have gotten through the process so far, which means they answered uh, Judge Mershine's questions, um, you know, in a way that uh, was acceptable to both lawyers, uh, answered the lawyers' questions uh, well. But uh, what we know is we've got um, a couple of lawyers on this uh, jury, People obviously familiar with the law, um, got a software engineer. Uh, the four person is 20 years, 28 years old, originally from Ireland. Uh, there's a teacher who was, um, you know, who had said some relatively positive things about President Trump, um, about uh, sort of liking the way that he handled himself at times. So uh, it's a little bit of a mix so far. Um, and, you know, in terms of the timing, it's not exactly clear. But if they got through seven today, you'd have to expect it's going to take at least a couple more days to fill out the rest of the jury. Absolutely. OK, we just want to hear about your experience now. I mean, you mentioned that closed circuit TV. So explain to viewers, you are actually down at the courthouse. You're in sort of an overflow room. What is it like? What are you seeing? What's even just the process of getting in there like when we have a former president and Secret Service on site? So you have um, you have to uh, sort of t take it from the perspective of the courtroom itself, mm. where Donald Trump is, is actually pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, and there you know, might be 100 or so, room for about 100 or so people in there. Um, and as a result of that, they got to put the potential jurors in there, uh, and they have some media in there, but then they have an overflow room, which is another courtroom, which is very similar, uh, almost a replica of uh, the one that Trump is in. Um, and so there's a lot of media in there, uh, about 100 or so each day. And you basically have to go through a metal detector to come in. Uh, then you have a second round of screening mm. um, that's a little bit more intense, go through your bags and stuff like that. Um, and then in that uh, overflow room, you're watching a closed circuit. Um, so at times, when, uh, particularly when there are jurors going in, uh, they'll black it out. You can hear it, but you can't see it because mm. the judge is going to such great lengths to try to protect the identities of mm. these jurors um, because of the high-profile nature of this case and the concern that uh, there could be some people who might try to intimidate them. Given, like, the consequential nature of this, you know, we keep talking about the first time that this is a criminal trial of a former president. What is the vibe like there? It, it, does it feel like that as you're kind of in the room, as you're walking it's, through the halls? It's solemn. It's really mm. solemn. And there's, yeah, there's a huge uh, police presence. I mean, it's a courthouse, so there's always going to be some uh, security presence mm -hmm. there. But uh, it is it is solemn. Uh, there are moments um, where where there's laughter. Um, you know, you can, <laughs> if, there, if something funny happens, something legitimately funny happens, everybody sees it that way. There's laughter. But I mean, this is, this is a serious thing mm. that's going on. Possibly, um, you know, it seems unlikely that uh, former President Trump would actually be imprisoned, even if he was convicted in this. But um, but the possibility of a former mm. president and someone who is running for president as the presumptive nominee of a major party going to jail in the middle of that, um, that's serious business. And w in fact, one of the prospective jurors even even said that he said, you know, this, this isn't uh, you know, this isn't a, a show. It's um, it's serious. A guy's, you know, life is on the line and countries yeah. online, things like that. So um, it's treated that way very much so. Yeah. Jonathan Allen, thank you so much. We appreciate the intel from inside the room, and we're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much. So good to see you in person. I know. You too. Well, meanwhile, as Trump is in the courtroom, his political opponent, President Biden, is on the campaign trail this week in Pennsylvania. Mr. Biden is in the middle of, the three -day, of a three-day swing through this important battleground state. He'll head to Pittsburgh later today to meet with steelworkers. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli joins us now from Scranton with more. Mike, good morning. So special place to President Biden. This is where he grew up. Walk us through the day yesterday as he sort of counter programs what we were discussing here with John, former President Trump's courtroom drama. Yeah, Savannah, great to be with you this morning. And it is quite the split screen, isn't it? No visit for Joe Biden to his hometown of Scranton would be complete if he didn't stop at 2446 North Washington Avenue. That was the home uh, he grew up in for the first 10 years of his life. He spent more than an hour and a half there, mostly behind closed doors. He also stopped by a Carpenters Union Hall where he met with some of the organizers who are running the ground game for his campaign here. He talked to them about how important the work they were doing at a time when so many people are getting their information from non-traditional sources like TikTok. But the heart of his visit here to Scranton yesterday was what was the most significant effort to date for the president to draw a clear policy contrast with Donald Trump on a key issue in this election, of course, the economy. Take a listen to part of the president's message yesterday. Folks, trickle-down economics failed the middle class. It failed America. And the truth is, Donald Trump embodies that failure. He wants to double down on trickle-down. Folks, he's coming for your money, 
your health care and your Social Security. And we're not going to let it happen. We're not going to, can't let it happen. Now, this was a substantive speech, but it was also an unusually personal speech for President Biden in the way he went after Donald Trump, unusually so. He mentioned his name 23 times, far more than we usually hear from this president. He even jabbed at his uh, financial woes, joking that if the stock price, price for his company went even lower, Trump would benefit more from his tax plan, Biden's, than from his own. Let's talk about what we are seeing in polling right now. I mean, this particular state, important swing state, of course, played a big role in President Biden winning in 2020. Recent polls, though, show Biden trailing in several swing states, including in Pennsylvania. What does he need to do to win the state again this year? Well, it starts, Savannah, with showing up. The president and the vice president have already campaigned in Pennsylvania eight times. We're in just the fourth month of the year. We can expect to see him come back an awful lot. This is an unusual multi-day swing through one state uh, as we're seeing the president make these three stops this week. Uh, but it's also important, and the president talked about this as well yesterday, the, the infrastructure his campaign has put on the ground here. They already have 14 campaign offices open across the state. Donald Trump has zero campaign offices in the state. His campaign also has $85.5 million in the bank that they can spend uh, on the air and on the ground as well. That's a significant advantage over what Donald Trump has. So he has the campaign apparatus behind him. He also has a team of surrogates behind him. The governor here, Josh Shapiro, very popular, introduced the president yesterday. And so those are all the elements of success here for a state that, yes, when we called this state in 2020, that was what put Biden over the top 270 electoral votes. They need to win here again. Mm -hmm. The president heading to Pittsburgh this afternoon, right? What can we expect to hear from him there? What's the rest of his schedule like? Yeah, this is another personally significant place for Joe Biden. It was where he held his first and his last rally of the 2020 campaign. It's always been kind of a political home base for him. And today he's going to be talking as an official event, we should know, and he's going to call for tripling the tariffs on imported steel and aluminum from China. China is a big political issue in this campaign. He's going to be doing this at a significant place at the Steelworkers Union Hall. Biden, of course, considers himself the most pro-labor president. This has been a top labor prior, a priority to crack down on the import of Chinese steel. He's also going to be calling to work with Mexico to make sure that they're not bringing in Chinese steel through the BRAC back door. So uh, another significant economic focused event for the president of Pennsylvania today. Savannah. All right, Mike Memoli, thank you so much. Well, the Middle East is holding its collective breath as it waits for Israel's response to that weekend drone and missile attack by Iran. Iran carried out the attack in retaliation for an Israeli strike on its consulate in Syria earlier this month that killed two top military commanders. Israel's war cabinet is meeting again today to discuss a response, while the United States and others are trying to talk Israel out of escalating the situation. That includes the United Kingdom, whose foreign secretary had this to say on a visit to Jerusalem today. It's clear the Israelis are making a decision to act. We hope they do so in a way that does as little to escalate this uh, as possible and in a way that, as I said yesterday, is, is smart as well as tough. But the real need is to refocus back on Hamas, back on the hostages, back on getting the aid in, backing on, back on getting a pause in the conflict in Gaza. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from Beirut, Lebanon. Matt, good morning. So as we just heard, Britain's foreign secretary says it's clear the Israelis are making a decision to act. Does that mean Israel is definitely going to hit back at Iran? What could the options look like here for retaliation? Well, your guess is as good as mine. It does sound as though we're going to hear in sort of military speak a kinetic response of some kind. And it looks as though we don't really know, and I'm not ex entirely sure that the Israelis have come to a decision either, but there are several options on the table. What we're seeing right now internationally is a diplomatic effort. Israeli has, the Israelis have asked some 30 different countries to impose harsher sanctions on Iran. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen when Iran did attack was that there were several Arab states who participated in helping Israel to shoot down some of those projectiles, either with intelligence or with, again, actual military help in the case of Jordan. And one of the things we do know about the history of Israeli behavior when it comes to these sorts of conflicts is that Israel does tend to choose the path of peace more often when they feel as though they're supported by their allies. So that's one of the reasons why we're starting to see such a diplomatic push and a lot of condemnation. A lot of these people, a lot of these allies, including Britain, who we just heard from, it's, you know, they want to show their support for the Israeli 
Israelis, while at the same time discouraging the Israelis from taking some sort of dramatic military action that really could escalate the situation beyond what it already is escalated as, you know, bringing this into a region-wide war that would involve not just Israel and Iran or the Gaza Strip, but also Iranian proxies throughout the region, like Hezbollah here in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, Iran-backed groups in Iraq and Syria, and of course Hamas, which is already very much involved in the conflict. And Matt, one other factor here, the fact that the Biden administration yesterday announced further sanctions on Iran. Tell us who and what those are targeting, but also could that impact Israel's response at all? It could very much impact Israel's response. As I just said, you know, Israel tends to sort of choose the path of peace when they feel that they're supported. And so this effort to try to clamp sanctions on the Iranians is kind of as much directed at Israel as it is at Iran, trying to reassure the Israelis that the West has their support, again, at the same time, discouraging them from taking lethal action in retribution against those Iranian attacks over the weekend. Now, what these sanctions are supposed to be doing, according to Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary and Joseph Burrell of the United uh, of the European Union, it looks as though they're going to be going against Iran's missile program, against its uh, use of the uh, IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is one of the groups that props up a lot of these proxies throughout the region that I just mentioned. These are targeted sanctions, but we have to remember here, Iran, until 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine, was the most sanctioned country in the entire world for decades. That hasn't stopped them, and it might not now. Matt, all this plays out, of course, as the war in Gaza on the ground continues to rage on. Um, we do have some new figures from Gaza's health ministry showing that more than 33,000 people have been killed. Our crews inside Gaza captured the aftermath of an Israeli strike yesterday on a refugee camp in, set in central Gaza and also a home in Rafah. Tell us about this. We're playing some of that video now, but tell us what happened. Yeah, that was a chaotic scene. About more than a dozen people were killed. More than two dozen people were injured in that strike on that al Mahazi refugee camp in central Gaza. You know, this is a, a strike that is not all that unusual to what we've been seeing by the Israelis for the past six months. The real fear now is that the Israelis are going to continue their attack on Rafah. That is the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip. It sits right along the border with Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. And so far, it is host to about 1.5 million Palestinians, almost all of them have been displaced once, twice, three times from elsewhere in the Gaza Strip. The Israelis told them to go there, and that is an impending attack by the Israelis on Rafah that a lot of aid agencies and advocacy groups are warning could lead to a humanitarian disaster. All right, Matt Bradley, as always, thank you for your reporting. Well, those tensions in the Middle East are creating issues here at home, specifically on college campuses. One major university is sparking outrage after canceling their valedictorian's graduation speech because of her online activity over the war. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has more. Controversy on campus after USC canceled the valedictorian's commencement speech citing safety concerns. Asna Tabassum was chosen by the USC provost to be this year's valedictorian, selected from nearly 100 qualifying students who applied. But at least two pro-Israel and Jewish groups complained to USC about the choice, pointing to Tabassum's social media activity, specifically a link to a free Palestine slideshow on her Instagram, which calls for the complete abolishment of the state of Israel. The university has to make the decision about whether this valedictorian and her propagation of anti-Semitic vitriol online is worthy of being the representative of the class of 2024. Tabassum said she is shocked and profoundly disappointed that the university is succumbing to a campaign of hate meant to silence my voice. Unfortunately, it is clear if you're a Muslim student today, you don't expect the university, your administration, to stand by you. The university's provost says the issue here is how best to maintain campus security and safety, period, and that the decision has nothing to do with freedom of speech. USC's commencement typically draws 65,000 people. University leadership has not shared details about potential threats. It kind of makes a lot of people uncomfortable, the fact that they're like putting it under safety concerns, but aren't willing to then elaborate on any of those safety concerns. The commencement controversy at USC, just the latest example of heightened tensions related to violence overseas spilling over on college campuses. Liz Kreutz, NBC News, Los Angeles.
Let's come back here at home. The impeachment trial for Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is set to kick off on Capitol Hill today. After months of delays, House Republicans delivered the two articles of impeachment against Mayorkas to the Senate with a dramatic walk through the Capitol you can see here yesterday. They accuse Mayorkas of, quote, willfully and systematically refusing to enforce immigration laws at the southern border. But just as House Speaker Mike Johnson signed off on those impeachment articles, he is facing a new threat to his job as a second Republican has now joined the effort to remove him from power. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin is here with more on all this. Julie, good morning. So we've got a lot to talk about. Let's start on this impeachment trial of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas. With that trial set to begin this afternoon, what should we expect, especially keeping in mind that this is taking place in the Senate controlled by Democrats? How will this play out? Yes, Savannah, good morning. And that is such an important point because Democrats control the Senate, which means they uniquely control this process. That's not stopping hardline Republicans in the Senate, particularly from pushing for a full trial. They held a press conference yesterday, a group of them uh, refusing to compromise with Democrats or agree to any rules to move this process along. They want a full trial. They're demanding it. The problem is Democrats have made it very clear, led by Leader Schumer, that they're not going to get it. So what's going to happen today? is, of course, the trial is going to begin as soon as senators are back on Capitol, uh, Capitol Hill later today. Uh, Democrats are more than likely just going to dismiss these articles altogether, but you can expect to see some conservatives trying to muck up the process on the Senate floor. For example, Senator Mike Lee, a Republican from Utah, said yesterday that if he does not get a full trial for Mayorkas, which, again, we don't expect, he's going to drag out uh, every single process on the Senate floor, even recessing or adjourning those typical things that happen by by unanimous consent of all 100 senators. So it's going to be dramatic, but more than likely, Democrats are just going to dismiss this. Julie, also tell us the latest in the effort, as I mentioned a moment ago, to oust Mike Johnson from his speakership. I understand it's gaining a little steam. Yeah, exactly. This has been brewing for the last several weeks. Marjorie Taylor Greene, before the two-week Easter recess in the House, introduced a motion to vacate, essentially kick Speaker Johnson out of the job. I know this sounds familiar because this is pretty much what happened to ousted Speaker Kevin McCarthy in the fall. That happened after both men put the government funding bills on the floor. Well, now Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, has a buddy. She has that second vote in order to move this process along. Of course, she's going to need all Democrats to agree to it, too. A lot of them already speaking out in defense of Johnson, moderate Republicans, Republicans in leadership yesterday, sending statements, posting on X in defense and support of Johnson. Uh, here's what Johnson had to say yesterday, though. Watch this. I am not resigning. And it is um, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. It is not help the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here. So the second Republican, Thomas Massey, actually joined in because Johnson unveiled plans to move foreign aid on the House floor. Remember, they had that $95 billion stalled Senate package. They passed that in February. The House has not taken it up for foreign aid to Ukraine, to Israel, to the Indo-Pacific, uh, because many Republicans in the House don't want to see aid to Ukraine move, especially without border security elements of which would never pass in the Democratic-controlled Senate, like H.R. 2. Uh, mm. Johnson is is poised to move forward with the separate four foreign aid bills, then presumably wanting to package it in the Senate. But so far, conservatives giving him a very hard time. Never a dull day on Capitol Hill, or therefore for you. Julie Serkin, thank you very much. <laughs> The former United States Democratic Senator and Florida Governor Bob Graham has died at the age of 87. He was a moderate and spent nearly four decades representing Florida, becoming one of the state's most popular politicians. He was an early critic of the Iraq War and served as chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee in a critical period following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. His daughter said in a statement he devoted his life to the betterment of the world around him. Let's now get you over to weather. We are tracking the latest on some back-to-back -back storm systems moving across the country as some spots in the Midwest are cleaning up from tornado damage this morning. And we say goodbye to that beautiful weather. We had a couple days up here. Hey, Angie, good morning. We sure did, Savannah. Good morning to you. We've already had from the same storm system that we've been watching over the past couple of days, 23 reports of tornadoes. Now we're going to continue to see the potential for severe weather with that same system. But we've got another one behind it that's going to dive through parts of the plains and leave us with another round of some severe weather. So let's 
let's give, get you the lay of the land. Here's that first system through today and tonight. The two areas that we're going to watch, parts of the Great Lakes extending into the Ohio Valley and then across the Northeast. The Northeast is where we'll see just kind of rain, that pesky weather that unfortunately will come in the afternoon hours and leave us with the potential for some wet roads on that commute likely slowing us down. But we've also got those strong storms that are possible across portions of the Great Lakes, specifically places like Detroit, Columbus, Fort Wayne, out to Pittsburgh. You have the best chance to see some of that. But we've got a little area right around Missouri and Kansas with Kansas City and the bullseye of that that has, again, that good chance to see some stronger storms. The impacts are going to remain the same. We've got the hail, the wind gusts, and a couple of tornadoes possible. As we look ahead to tomorrow, notice that system, uh, that secondary system, will start to work into parts of the plains. We've got the shower and thunderstorms possible from Texas to the Midwest. And you guessed it, once again, severe weather will be possible for 14 million people. Those wind gusts uh, up to 60 miles per hour, that one inch hail is possible and a couple of tornadoes can't be ruled out. So we'll keep a close eye on that. If you're in St. Louis, Evansville, Poplar Bluff, Dallas, those are the spots with the best chance of that. Meanwhile, temperatures, Savannah said, it's been nice across the East Coast and we've got those temperatures feeling like summer for a lot of folks today. 87 degrees in Oklahoma City, Little Rock heads to the mid 80s, Atlanta into the low 80s. So running way warm, typical kind of summer like temperatures in places like Raleigh with a high of 88 degrees tomorrow, upper 70s, Washington, D.C. But roller coaster ride, here we come because temperatures go from the uh, 80s in places like Raleigh on Friday to the 60s mm. by Sunday. We are back to more typical temperatures in Washington, D.C. by Friday, Saturday, and even cooler than that on Sunday. And I just like can't get it right. The last few days I was so hot in what I came to work in. And then yep. this morning I was like, oh, great, I'm chilly. Did you bring your Leaving umbrella in though? the dark? No, of well, course not. <laughs> I failed you. <laughs> the morning text, Andy. Okay, we, I'll get on that. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Add me to your list, I'm sure. Well. Thank you so much. There's much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, flight risk. A Boeing engineer turned whistleblower taking his claims about the 787 Dreamliner jet to Capitol Hill. What to expect ahead of today's testimony. But up first, after the break, Olympic dreams. American weightlifter Hampton Morris getting ready to represent Team USA. He joins us to talk about his preparations for Paris with the opening ceremony not just 100 days away. We can't wait to talk with him. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's get you some international headlines. We're going to start with record-breaking rainfall in Dubai. Megan Fitzgerald joins us with that and more. Hey, Megan, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. That's right. We start in the Middle East where torrential rain battered parts of the Middle East, uh, causing massive flooding. The United Arab Emirates says in the last 24 hours, they witnessed the largest rainfall in 75 years, killing at least one person, triggering massive flooding from streets to the tarmac in Dubai's International Airport, causing flights delay to be delayed and forcing schools to close. Now, the airport is advising people not to come unless it's absolutely necessary. In neighboring Oman, at least 18 people have died because of severe weather. Saudi Arabia and Qatar were also hit by storms. And in the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak plans to ban anyone 15 and under from ever buying cigarettes. It's a proposed bill that's progressing. Uh, Parliament passed its very first vote on Tuesday. The bill would be one of the world's strictest anti-smoking laws. Sunak's goal is to take on what he calls the single biggest entirely preventable cause of ill health, and death. And guys, good news for Shakira fans. The Colombian superstar just released dates for her 2024 world tour. Uh, you got 14 chances to see her live. The tour kicks off in early November in Palm Desert, California, before heading to Phoenix, Los Angeles, San Antonio, Dallas, Miami, pretty much all the major big cities in the U.S. and Canada. The tour ends in Detroit in mid-December. And guys, this is the first time she's been on tour since 2018. Uh, and she says she's been taking notes from Beyonce's Renaissance tour. So, you know, I'd say pretty high bar there. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. I bet. But she could meet it. It's Shakira. It's awesome. All right, yeah, Megan, thank so. you so much. Well, speaking of international news, here's something we can all certainly get excited about. The countdown to the Paris Olympics is in full swing. We are now just 100 days away from the opening ceremony. In just a few short months, thousands of athletes will head to the City of Light to make their mark at the Summer Games. And this morning, we're getting to know one of the athletes who will be representing Team USA, American weightlifter Hampton Morris. He joins us now. 
here in studio. Hampton, good morning. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Thank you for having me. This is so exciting. I mean, for us mere mortals who are not able to lift what you can lift and will never be Olympic athletes, it's very cool to have you here with us, just so you know. We're geeking out. Um, okay, so I'm going to read some stats here, and then you're going to help me understand all of them. You became the first American man to break a senior weightlifting record since 1969, 55 years. First, just tell me about that moment. Um, it, it was just amazing. Um, <laughs> I, so my dad, who's my coach, um, he told me that if we knew for sure going into my session um, that I'd officially made the Paris team, <laughs> uh, then we'd just have fun and just swing for something big. Uh, and I've, I've done more than that in training. So I knew that it was completely a possibility. I knew that I was completely capable of it. It was just a matter of doing it in the moment. It was just amazing to be able to have that opportunity. Oh, absolutely. I love that. Like, if we know it, we're just going to do something fun. We're just going to enjoy it. And then I understand that you breaking the world record, the specific record was the clean and jerk in the 135 pounds weight class by lifting 388 pounds. So just first of all, to make sure that I understand, that means that you're lifting way more than double your body weight, right? Yes, ma'am. And explain a clean and jerk. Uh, so the clean and jerk is uh, two movements done together. Uh, the clean is a ground-to-shoulder movement, and then the jerk is a shoulder-to-overhead movement. This is it? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, so above your head there was 388 pounds. Yes. <laughs> Do you remember that moment? Like, what, what, it, what you were thinking, what you were feeling when you stepped up to that bar and were about to do it? Um, yeah, so when I was... Um, when I was getting the chalk on my hands to... Mm -hmm. they, we use it to grip the bar better. Um... So when I was talking up, I was looking out in the crowd, and I could hear the entire, <laughs> we, this was in Thailand, the entire Thai, Thai cheering section uh, was cheering USA, USA, <laughs> and it was like a third of the stands, and the Thai cheering section is just amazing, they're like coordinated with chants, they have all kinds of, oh. um, like, like decorations and outfits, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, and it, it will you ever just... forget that moment hearing the USA USA right before? Definitely not. <laughs> How cool to have them cheering for you! That's very neat. Um, I understand you also broke the American records in the snatch and for total weight lifted between the snatch and clean and jerk. <laughs> Did you expect to break all these records? Um, the only one that I wasn't completely sure about was the world record. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, I, I knew that all of them were a possibility. Uh-huh. Uh, but the only one that I was... The, the main one I was worried about was the world record. Uh, it's obviously the biggest one. Right. Uh, it's so but, exciting. Yes, you mentioned your yes. dad being your coach. Yes, What's that been like through all this? Um, it's It's been amazing. I, I love that I get to share something so important with him yeah. um it's it, it's been about eight years of competitions um I, i'm i'm just so proud that we can <laughs> do this together is it emotional for you seeing any of these videos or reliving any of these moments uh it, it just gets me pumped up it's so it's so <laughs> exciting <laughs> And also another thing that's really cool, the last men's weightlifting medal for Team USA came in the 1984 LA Games. Does that pump you up thinking that you could be the next one? It absolutely does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are you doing to get ready for Paris? Um, so, so this Olympic quad has had a lot of really fast turnarounds between competitions uh, just with the way that qualification has been set up. Mm. Um, but now I have about four months before before the Paris Games, so I'll just be hitting hitting training really hard, uh, just in preparation for that. Really, really glad that I have this much time mm. to prepare. Absolutely. 
Hamden Morris, thank you so much. Congratulations and good luck. We'll be rooting for you. We so appreciate you coming by. It's so cool to you. talk to somebody <laughs> heading to represent Team USA. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be checking in. Coming up, unfit to fly a Boeing whistleblower set to face lawmakers over his claims that the popular Dreamliner jet could be unsafe. What we know about his testimony set for today on Capitol Hill and how the company is responding. This is Morning News Now. We are back with an alarming new report that's shedding light on the rise of anti-Semitism in the U.S. According to the Anti-Defamation League's annual audit, the number of anti-Semitic incidents has gone up by 140 percent since 2022. The nearly 9,000 incidents reported in 2023 include harassment, vandalism, assault, as well as bomb threats. We're going to dig into this now. Here on set with us is Anti-Defamation League CEO and National Director Jonathan Greenblatt. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us on set thank and you. shedding light on this important report. So just, I mean, really some startling numbers here. Tell us what we are seeing in this dramatic spike in numbers how much of a surprise or maybe not a surprise it was to you? What did you make of this? Well, I don't know that it's a surprise, but it's still just staggering. Mm -hmm. So the ADL has been tracking anti-Semitic incidents for 45 years. We get reports from law enforcement, we get reports from victims, and we investigate and verify everything that we publish. And we've watched these numbers after being low for decades. Starting in 2016, they began to tick up mm. and then really surge. And last year, was the highest year that we've ever seen. Now, what's important to note, though, it's the fourth time in the past five years that we've broken a record. Wow. And yet, whereas 22 was the highest before, 23, with 8,873 acts of hate, that is 140% greater than the prior year. That is literally almost 900% greater than a decade ago. So something is definitely happening. Obviously, we know at the end of last year, towards the end of last year, beginning of October, yeah. uh, was when the Israel-Hamas war began. Yeah. How much of a spike do you think is related to that? Did you see anything? Can you tell definitively from October to December? And then what do you think that sets us up for as we are still watching that unravel this year? It's really quite uh, nerve-wracking. So again, while these hostages are still being held in Gaza, while civilians are still being killed on both sides, starting on October the 7th, we saw 5,200 and change incidents between October the 7th and the end of the year. That alone, Savannah, would be more than any single year we've ever tracked. So again, I would just point out, you could have frustration about what's happening in the Middle East, but to hold American Jews collectively responsible for policies you don't like of the Israeli government, that's, what, that's as wrong as, say, holding you know, Asian Americans responsible for what Beijing did on COVID-19 or holding any other minority responsible for what happens around the world. As we've watched what's unfolded in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas, mm -hmm. how do you think American Jewish people feel about expressing their concerns over anti-Semitism? Has it made it a good question. easier or has it made it scarier? I think it's made it scarier. I think, you know, I spent the day at Harvard Law School on Thursday, and these are the best of the best. Mm -hmm. And to hear their stories of feeling abandoned by their former friends, feeling alienated from much of the mainstream in the school, and really feeling alone. Mm -hmm. Because where they had, whereas, again, they used to be part of that school in every single way, and they still are certainly enrolled students there, but they have continually been isolated and marginalized by the sort of pro-Hamas crowd at the school mm. and the administration. They don't feel supported. So it'll be interesting because today, as you likely know, Columbia President Shafiq is testifying before Congress. There's been a lot of issues on these college campuses. We've seen a massive spike in anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist incidents on colleges and mm. universities. That's why ADL released a report card just last week assessing these schools. It'll be interesting to see what happens today on Capitol Hill. How is the Anti-Defamation League addressing what they're seeing? What can be done? Well, look, I think at ADL, we think, you know, you got to do all you can to fight hate. Number one, we need our leaders to lead. Elected officials, public personalities, call out hate when it happens. Mm. Unequivocally, and call it out to whom it happens. So if anti-Semitism happens, call that out, period. Number two, we're pushing a new campaign we call 50 States Against Hate. President Biden lost a net, launched a national strategy to fight anti-Semitism last year. We want governors now to mm. do the same. And then finally, back to campuses, 
we really think it's important that the campuses simply enforce their own policies. Like, again, frustration about what's happening in Gaza isn't an excuse to spit on Jewish students, isn't an excuse to vandalize the Hillel, isn't an excuse to harangue and intimidate your classmates. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, college presidents should, you know, apply the rules and enforce consequences on people who violate them. Jonathan Greenblatt, thank you very much for coming by to tell us more about this report. We really Thanks, appreciate man. your time and important stuff. You. Good to see you. Later this morning, a Boeing engineer turned whistleblower will testify before Congress about what he's calling flaws with the plane maker's 787 Dreamliner jet. For its part, Boeing says these latest claims have no merit. In an NBC News exclusive, that whistleblower spoke to our senior correspondent, Tom Costello, about his concerns. Boeing 787 Dreamliner has been flying since 2011, made of a lightweight composite material and stronger than a typical aluminum fuselage. But a current Boeing quality engineer has told the FAA he believes the plane has a potentially fatal flaw. I think it's as serious as I have ever seen in my lifetime. 15-year Boeing veteran Sam Salapur will tell Congress Wednesday that the gaps between big pieces of the fuselage are too big. And even though they're fastened together, the stress could create fatigue failure in the fuselage after thousands of flights. What would happen if you had a fatigue failure in a 787 at altitude? The plane will fall apart at the joints where they're, we're talking about. Once you fall apart, you're going to descend all the way to the ground. You think the plane could literally break apart in air? Absolutely. But Boeing tells NBC News we are fully confident in the 787 Dreamliner because of the comprehensive work done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate. These issues do not present any safety concerns. In 2020, Boeing worked with the FAA to tighten paper-thin gaps, pausing plane deliveries for two years, stress testing the plane to 165,000 takeoffs and landings, more than three times a typical 787's lifespan, and inspecting 689 planes already in service. Boeing says it found zero evidence of fatigue. Even if these cracks would form, which there's no evidence of, the airplane is so resistant and so structurally robust, according to Boeing, that they're not going to break apart. Salapur was moved from the 787 project in 2022, he claims, in retaliation for raising these concerns internally. Boeing insists retaliation is strictly prohibited. Salapur admits he does not have access to all of Boeing's test data. Still, with 1,100 planes in service, he'll tell Congress the 787 should not be flying. Should Boeing ground the 787 right now to check the gap sizes? I would say they need to. The entire fleet worldwide? The entire fleet worldwide, as far as I'm concerned right now, needs an attention. On Monday, Boeing gave reporters a detailed briefing on its extensive stress tests, its reputation on the line after two fatal MAX 8 crashes overseas, and the MAX 9 door plug blowout in January, the subject of Wednesday's congressional hearing. Salapur's attorney says she's heard from more than half a dozen other potential whistleblowers with similar concerns. Have any of those whistleblowers agreed to come forward yet? Not yet. I think some of them will come forward, but frankly, they're terrified. I'm at peace with myself because this is going to save a lot of people's lives. That's what's at stake. That's what's at stake. Our thanks to Tom Costello for that important report. Coming up, Matters of the Heart, the new link between breast cancer survivors' everyday diet and heart disease. The doctor is in for your weekly checkup. That is next on Morning News Now. We are back now with our weekly medical checkup. This week, we'll be diving deeper into the story we've been covering on reports of fake Botox and the adverse reaction it's causing for some that have been treated with it, plus the benefits of a healthy diet and why researchers say it may lower the risk of heart disease, specifically for breast cancer survivors. So we've got NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sile here with the very latest. Doctor, always great to have you with us. Good morning. Let's start on this Botox story we've been covering. So explain this to us. Federal officials, the backstory here is on Tuesday, they warned that big Botox is to blame in several states for reports of these bad reactions. How does something like this happen? How does it end up in patients? I mean, if you're going to, is this happening in legitimate, you know, dermatology offices or med spas? Like, how is this getting into a patient? All excellent questions, and we'll answer all of those, Savannah. So, so 
to start, I think a lot of people don't know this, and, and the way Botox works is it's a toxin, it's a neurotoxin, mm -hmm. and essentially it, it prevents your muscles in your face and your, your, you know, your forehead to, from contracting, and that can actually get rid of fine lines and wrinkles, which is why a lot of people get it done. Mm -hmm. um, but Savannah, to answer your question, a lot of these reports, I think we're at 19 women in nine different states now, wow. um, these were all done in unlicensed facilities, and you mm -hmm. know, a lot of people are getting into the Botox game because for some people it can be lucrative, they can make a lot of money doing that, and what happens is you can get a lot of bad actors, you can get people who aren't really licensed who are performing Forming this. And you can see here, yeah, 19, 19 reports from women in nine states. They're having problems with vision, breathing, and swallowing because, again, Botox does act on muscles, and you worry that it's getting into muscles it shouldn't be getting into. Wow, right. Um, and injected in non medical settings from unlicensed people. Um, and so, Savannah, there, are, there is something you can do about it, fortunately. Um, so the doctor's orders here, you know, if you are going to get Botox, it's absolutely okay to do so. Just make sure that you're checking that the person is licensed. Um, if, if they're not providing you with a license or you can't find it and, you know, you're not using an FDA-approved product, don't get the jab, especially now when we're seeing reports of these concerning symptoms because Botox, again, does paralyze muscles. You want to make sure it's not paralyzing muscles that it shouldn't be. Yeah, because that's kind of twofold, right? It's like, is the product good and legitimate? And also, does the person who's putting it in your face know where to put it in your face? Exactly, yeah. Right? You, you don't want to end up with a bad Botox job either. So just make sure the person is licensed. Yeah, absolutely. Good advice there. Okay, let's now shift to that one about diet here and this yeah. link with heart disease and also breast cancer survivors. I mean, I think it's probably no surprise to hear a healthy diet is helpful in a avoiding heart disease, but what is this link? So, Savannah, just some background here. You know, for, for breast cancer survivors, um, the, the, the biggest non-sort of cancer cause of death for them is heart disease. And they're actually at a greater risk of heart disease than the rest of the population. It's kind of a double whammy because, uh, you know, a lot of the treatments we use for breast cancer, whether it's some of the drugs we use, immunotherapy, mm. or whether it's radiation, they can actually affect the heart. And so, you know, a lot of people think that if you survive cancer, you're, you're good. But the reality is there's a lot of long-term effects people deal with. I and mean, so what these researchers wanted to do is they studied what's called a DASH diet, basically a diet we usually use for, for high blood pressure, things that are rich mm. in fruits and veggies, whole grains. Um, and, and they wanted to see, does that affect survivorship? And I have some numbers here. 47% mm. uh, reduced risk of heart failure, 20% reduced risk of cardiac arrest and arrhythmias. Um, so doctor's orders here, Savannah, stick to whole foods and vegetables as much as you can, and you want to stay away from high salt and high processed foods. And if you are somebody who has survived, make sure you mention that to your doctor because there are special tests you may need to get down the line. All right, Dr. Akshay Sayo, always great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Good ones today. Anytime. Let's turn to some financial headlines now. We're going to start with the latest plans from United Airlines. And we've got CNBC's Bertha Coombs joining us with that and other news. Bertha, who we haven't seen in a minute. Good morning, Bertha. Great to have you with us. <laughs> Good morning, buenos dias, Savannah. Let's start with United Airlines. Uh, the airliner plans to lease nearly three dozen planes from Airbus in the next few years as it deals with a shortfall in deliveries from Boeing. United's profit took a hit in the first quarter from that three-week grounding of the Boeing 737 MAX 9, the model involved in the door plug blowout on Alaska Airlines. United had been counting on a steady stream of new planes from Boeing, but now with fewer available, it's actually finding itself overstaffed and plans to pause hiring of new pilots and is actually encouraging its current pilots to take unpaid leave. Meantime, the Biden administration is teaming up with states to protect airline customers. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg announcing a partnership to fast-track investigations into complaints against airlines and ticket agents. States will now be able to examine and refer complaints to the federal government. Complaints rose sharply last year, even though the number of canceled flights actually hit a 10-year low. And Crocs and Pringles are combining fashion and flavor. The brands are teaming up to offer a variety of shoes in a limited edition drop, including boots, clogs, classic slides, and charms. With the purchase of the Pringles and Crocs Classic Crush, buyers will also be eligible to get Crocktail a Party, a can with a new Pringles flavor, watermelon chili lime. The new items are available now while supplies last. This doesn't seem like the best story to have after you had a doctor talking about not eating processed foods. <laughs> That's very true. Saying. Also, if I saw someone coming down the street with Pringles strapped to their ankles, I would just about lose it. <laughs> this is so bizarre. Oh, Bertha Coombs, always fun. Thank you for bringing us a good one. See you in a bit. And coming up, a story that is good for the soul. When we return, we'll introduce you to a shoe cobbler turned TikTok star who's winning over hearts with his family business. Don't step away. This is Morning News Now.
finally this hour, we want to introduce you to the unlikely TikTok star with a job that is good for the soul. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has his story. What we do is we take a, like a heel popper and we pop that off. For anyone looking for a nice new soul, there may be no finer option than America's cobbler, Jim McFarland. How would you describe your job to someone who doesn't know what a cobbler is? A shoe cobbler is someone that takes your shoes and recrafts them back to the original factory condition. The family business built on buffing, stitching, and gluing beloved footwear goes back to 1900. We're in our 124th year. But Jim initially resisted the craft. I, I didn't want to be in this business. I saw how hard my dad worked. Still, he found himself back in the shop when his father got sick. Now his videos are captivating people around the world. His social media secret weapon, his daughter, Tori. Our first video that we posted got over 2 million views over the course of a week. But I think we were like, mm, that was just like a stroke of luck. Millions and millions of views on future posts proved it wasn't. Now he's making people smile. Ooh, she's so pretty. And some. A lot of people will send us letters. Are making him cry like this father who recently lost his 16 year old son. He passed away four weeks ago and they wear the same size boot. You take every ounce of love you have inside and you put them into those boots mm -hmm. and you hope when he puts those on it gives him some kind of band-aid on his heart. He's touching souls for sure. The ones on our feet and those in our hearts. Sam Brock, NBC News, Lakeland, Florida. Wow, who knew a story like that could bring tears to your eyes? Well, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Thanks for hanging with us. Don't go anywhere. The news continues right now. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Wednesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe's off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, Middle East on edge as Israel decides what its next move will be. Iran's president delivered a stark warning, saying the tiniest invasion would be met with a massive response. The new action being taken by the U.S. and the fight over the war in Gaza that's now playing out online. Also this morning, the first seven jurors have been seated in the historic criminal trial of Donald Trump. Among them, a teacher, a lawyer, and a nurse. We're taking you inside the selection process in the heated moment that the judge scolded the former president for. Also, she may be one of the biggest names in basketball, but this morning, the gap between Caitlin Clark's WNBA salary and her male counterparts is sparking outrage. We're digging into the pay disparity and why Clark's star power could mean a bigger payday for the whole league. And it looks like a scene from Jumanji, an elephant on the loose strolling through the streets of Montana, how Viola was able to escape and how circus staff finally brought her back home. I am quite excited to learn the details on that one. Thanks again for joining us this morning. We're going to get started this hour in the Middle East, which is bracing for Israel's response to those missile attacks carried out by Iran over the weekend. They were in retaliation to an Israeli strike on Iran's consulate in Syria earlier this month, which killed senior Iranian commanders. The U.S. is announcing new sanctions on Iran while urging Israel to show restraint in response. The tensions come as dozens of Palestinians were killed in the latest round of Israeli strikes on Gaza. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has more from Tel Aviv. Israel is still calibrating its expected response to Iran's failed attack this weekend. And Iran is now saying it will not hesitate to strike back. Iran's president this morning couldn't have been more clear with a message to Israel, don't attack. Speaking at an army parade, he said that even the tiniest invasion by Israel would bring a massive and harsh response. We visited an Israeli military base where weapons used against Israel since October 7th are collected and analyzed. The Hamas weapons are deadly, but mostly small. Grenades and rockets with ranges of 50 miles or less. What Iran launched was in a different league. 
This is the tail end of one of the ballistic missiles that Iran fired at Israel over the weekend, where the engine was. It broke off when this missile was intercepted. And it's only when you're standing right up next to these do you understand how big they are. That's where the warhead was. It also broke off, carrying 800 pounds of explosives. Had these gotten through, it would have been catastrophic. Gazans are now living in a constant catastrophe. Our crew filmed the casualties from an Israeli airstrike on a market in central Gaza. Medical officials say at least 12 people were killed with many injured. Israel accuses the militants of hiding among civilians. The war here is polarizing, triggering protests and hatred on both sides, in part because of false information, often deliberately planted. This morning, we visited Syabra, a private Tel Aviv-based company that tracks disinformation. The company is releasing its findings this morning on Iran's weekend attack. Its results show that 26% of the social media accounts discussing the attack were fake, created to sway opinion. The red is the fake, the green is the real. They pushed three main narratives, sowing panic that World War III is imminent, that Israel is a terrorist state, and that Iran is a powerful nation. It is disturbing to think how polluted our social media feeds always are and that it gets much worse during a time of crisis. And generally what happens here is a precursor for what happens in other countries, including the United States, looking ahead to the U.S. presidential elections. Also today, Washington is preparing new sanctions against Iran. All right, Richard, thank you so much. We're now joined by former NBC News correspondent and Tel Aviv Bureau Chief Martin Fletcher. Martin, as always, thank you for joining us. So do you believe that an Israeli retaliation against Iran is a foregone conclusion right now, especially when you add in what Richard just mentioned there at the end, U.S., European sanctions? Could that impact or dissuade Israel from attacking Iran? So, Manu, I don't think that the sanctions threats by, by Europe and the United States will impact Israel's final decision, because we're hearing from all sources, political and military, that Israel has decided to, to retaliate in some way. Now, the difference is, is retaliation the same as attacking? We're not, it's not clear that Israel will actually mm. attack Iran directly. Um, but they may retaliate in different ways. They may... They may launch a cyber war against Iran. They may, they may attack Iranian proxies in the region, especially we're hearing Hezbollah in, in South Lebanon. So there are different ways that Israel can respond without an attack on Iran, because the great fear from everybody, of course, is that this will be a wider, a, could become easily a wider war. But the sanctions that you mentioned um, will be critical. They will be very important. They will hurt Iran. But I don't think from what we're hearing from the government here that there will be enough to stop an Israeli response of some kind. So Iran says it will retaliate again if and when Israel responds. You very smartly point out it doesn't not necessarily mean that we know yet if that Israel response is going to look like an attack. However, what could possible tit-for-tat attacks or going back and forth here with retaliation, retaliation, what would that mean for the region? Oh, it would be terrible, Savannah. The, if, if Israel does launch an, an attack on the, on the territory of Iran, and again, it's, just an, it's an if, if they do that, then and another if, if Iran follows through on their, on their threat of what they call a massive attack on Israel afterwards, well, of course, this, this is going to inc increase the likelihood of the, of the war spreading. Uh, America is already committed to helping defend Israel. At the same time, as America said they will definitely not help any kind of Israeli attack on Iran. So it's clear that the tensions are boiling. But one of the interesting points, Savannah, is that the only thing probably that Iran and Israel actually agree on is that they don't want a wider war. And yet everything they're doing suggests they're sliding in that direction. So this is a very, very sensitive period in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Middle East, obviously in terms of Iran and Israel, but also the wider question. There are also the, another issue is that there, those Arab states that helped Israel defend itself against the Iranian, atta Iranian attack are now also being threatened verbally by Iran. So it, it, this can easily spread to, to, a, to a terrible conflagration in the area. And the hope, of course, is that it won't. And that will depend on what Israel's response will be. Mm. 
Martin Fletcher, as always, we so appreciate your expertise here and your nuance. Thank you for joining us. Well, jury selection will resume tomorrow in the hush money trial of former President Trump right here in New York. The first seven jurors have been seated and sworn in after a slow start to the process earlier this week. The former president is accused of falsifying business records related to alleged hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett has the latest developments. Hey there, what started as a painfully slow process turned into a far more revealing look at the lives of the people brought into court. Their digital footprints laid bare for everyone. A remarkable moment as several people were forced to explain things they said about the former president years ago online, now directly to his face. Seven people now officially sworn in as jurors to hear the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump. A cross-section of Manhattan residents openly revealing their views of the likely GOP nominee as Mr. Trump sat in court listening to lawyers spar over who could be fair and impartial. Everything is screwed up in New York and the whole world is watching. Roughly two dozen prospective jurors eventually whittled down to the foreman, a 28-year-old in sales, originally from Ireland. Two attorneys, an oncology nurse, an IT consultant, a teacher, and a software engineer. Those jurors getting only a short preview of the charges Mr. Trump has pled not guilty to for falsifying business records in an effort, prosecutors say, to bury evidence of a payout to an adult film actress on the eve of the 2016 election, something Mr. Trump has repeatedly denied. The final panel of 12 jurors and six alternates will stay anonymous, but some prospective jurors were confronted Tuesday with old social media posts uncovered by the defense team. One man who wrote, quote, lock him up on Facebook, removed by the judge for cause. Others expressing support for the former president. The often tedious nature of the jury selection process turning into almost an impromptu focus group. One woman saying he stirs the pot. One man revealing he was a big fan of The Apprentice in middle school. A former corrections officer saying he kind of enjoys the way Mr. Trump walks into a room. One of the excused jurors finding the process surreal. You get the sense that it's like, oh, this is just another guy. And also he sees me talking about him, which is bizarre. But day two of trial was also marked by a flash of anger from the judge, appearing disturbed by something inaudible Mr. Trump apparently muttered as a juror was questioned about Facebook posts, scolding the former president, I will not have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. Jury selection will continue Thursday morning. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you so much. Well, now let's head to Capitol Hill where lawmakers are getting ready to look over a plan from House Speaker Mike Johnson that would provide funding for Ukraine and Israel. This comes as two of Johnson's fellow Republicans are supporting an effort to oust him. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now with the latest. Ryan, good morning, Ryan. I don't think I've seen you since just your family's star-turning moment during <laughs> Eclipse coverage, which was just too adorable. Viewers, if you didn't see it, look it up online. It's too cute. So sorry to talk about something a little less fun, but what should we know about the bills that are being brought to the floor regarding aid to Ukraine and Israel? Yeah, I'd much rather be dancing at the eclipse with my family, but uh, the day job uh, requires us to talk mm -hmm. about it. I, you know, the first thing, Savannah, that we should know about these bills is that we don't know what they look like yet. Uh, the speaker has yet to unveil his plan to bring uh, four separate bills to the floor that would provide funding for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan and also some other national security priorities. Uh, but it, this comes with a lot of risk for Speaker Johnson because that group of hard right Republicans have been very insistent that if he brings Ukraine aid to the floor in any form or fashion, he will face, uh, face a motion to vacate, which could remove him as Speaker of the House. Uh, so he's got to decide whether or not he wants to take that risk if he believes that funding for Ukraine is so necessary that he's willing to sacrifice his job. Uh, we're not exactly sure what direction he plans to go in. He's been huddling with Republicans across the spectrum to try to get an idea of what what they would find palatable. Uh, but right now, uh, we're just waiting to see what the speaker will do. As we've mentioned, Ryan, there's this now growing momentum among some House Republicans to remove Speaker Johnson from his leadership role, originally sort of led by Marjorie Taylor Greene. And now we are seeing uh, at least some more support there. Tell us about this and where things stand on that front. 
Yeah, yesterday we saw Tom Massey, who's a, a congressman from uh, Kentucky, come out and say that he would join Marjorie Taylor Greene's effort uh, to topple uh, Mike Johnson from his speaker's post. And, and that's significant because it would only take a handful of Republicans if all Democrats voted uh, to remove Johnson as well from his speakership. So that really puts his job in danger. But we do, though, starting to see play out here, though, are some Democratic voices that are saying if Speaker Johnson has the courage to put Ukraine aid on the floor in, in a way that they find palatable that they would be there for him and would either vote to table a resolution uh, to, to vacate the chair or would uh, outright vote to keep him uh, in office, which would keep those uh, Republican threats at bay. The issue, though, for Johnson is that would mean Democrats saved his speakership and it would be uh, just add to this list of, of ways that Democrats have helped him uh, govern as the leader of the speaker, as speaker of the House, you know, in uh, a far bygone days of Congress. Congress, uh, bipartisanship uh, would be seen as a good thing by the voters. Uh, that's not so much the way the political climate works right now. So this is a very difficult position, position mm -hmm. that Speaker Johnson finds himself in. He could save his speakership, but it might mean that Democrats are there to rescue him. Absolutely. Brian, very quickly before I let you go, I do have to ask about the articles of impeachment against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. What's expected to happen next in the Senate? So the Senate uh, will swear in uh, all the senators as jurors this afternoon. Then we're going to find out how long this will last. Uh, Republicans believe a full trial is necessary. Democrats want to move quickly to either table or dismiss the motions. Uh, we'll see the Republicans at least attempt to try and find a way to extend this process as long as possible. But the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has said that he does not think uh, that this is necessary, and they're going to try and end this as quickly as possible. Savannah. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. Well, former Florida Florida Senator and Governor Bob Graham passed away, according to a statement from his family. They called him a visionary leader and dedicated public servant, as well as a loving husband, father, and grandfather. Graham was a three-term three -term, excuse me, Democratic senator from Florida who gained prominence for speaking out against the Iraq War. He also made a name for himself for his workday appearances, where he would spend a day doing hundreds of jobs alongside the people he represented. He was 87 years old. Well, let's turn now to the severe weather sweeping across several states. This morning, many Americans in the Midwest are bracing for another round of extreme storms. It comes as the region cut, recovers from a night of hail, damaging winds, and destructive tornadoes. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now from New London, Iowa, with the latest. Hey, Shaq, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. And as the sun starts to rise, the scenes like the one behind me become more and more clear. You see this building here? It's almost indistinguishable. You see it's essentially a pile of rubble, and it's the result of just one of the nearly two dozen tornadoes to sweep across the region as millions of people across the country are facing a new threat. Overnight, alarms sounding as a dangerous tornado outbreak swept through the plains and Midwest. Not looking good. Reports of more than 20 tornadoes. It's coming our way. Tearing roofs off buildings, snapping trees, and leaving homes in tatters. That's a big old tornado. Funnel clouds spotted from Kansas and Nebraska. Look at that funnel right up there. To Illinois and Missouri, where authorities say a tornado in Smithville injured two people when it toppled their camper. Tornadoes across the region turning buildings into rubble, with wind gusts in some areas reaching up to 70 miles an hour. The roof just got picked up and it flipped over on itself. In Iowa, a tornado took the roof off this church. I don't know if we'll end up fixing the, the building or if it'll be a total loss. And in the Quad Cities, even forecasters at the National Weather Service forced to hunker down, posting on social media, during the tornado warning, we took cover in our storm shelter at the office. A Sioux County sheriff posting this picture of this mangled playset as a deputy sheriff caught dramatic lightning strikes on his cruiser's dash cam video. The severe weather also impacting air travel across the Midwest, with over 600 flights delayed out of Chicago's Midway Airport alone. All part of a severe weather system now moving east, with more rain, hail, and tornadoes possible. We got one that time. And this morning, we know that the National Weather Service is deploying storm damage survey teams to scenes like the one behind me. And look, the threat is not just tornadoes. We know that yesterday there were thousands of Iowans who were without power. It's the impact of the wind and rain and a threat that is now moving east.
Savannah. All right, Jack Brewster, thank you so much. Well, now let's check in with meteorologist Angie Lastman. She's here with the latest on the storm's track. Angie, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. We've got not one, but two storm systems that we're going to watch. This first one is the same one that caused all the damage that you saw Shaq just talking about, but we've got a secondary threat that we're going to watch for tomorrow when it comes to severe storms thanks to that next system. The first system, though, is going to work through parts of the Great Lakes, eventually bringing some rain out towards the northeast here as we get through the day today. But if you're looking for where we'll see that, those greatest chances for some stronger storms later today. Places like Detroit, Fort Wayne, Columbus to Pittsburgh, uh, as well as folks across parts of Missouri and Kansas, specifically Kansas City, right in the bullseye of seeing those same impacts, the hail, the winds, and even a couple of tornadoes. There's the secondary cold front that's going to work its way to the east, again, firing up some thunderstorms. We'll see that from places like the Texas all the way up into the Midwest, Evansville, St. Louis, Poplar Bluff, and Dallas. Those are the spots with the best chance of seeing some of that active weather here tomorrow. Uh, uh, but again, look how expansive it is. It does include 14 million people as we get through the day tomorrow. Looking ahead to your weekend, it looks like Friday we'll see some of those strong storms still in the picture across parts of the east. We've got the record highs for the south uh, and plenty of sunshine across much of the western, really half of the country. We'll see some mild conditions into the 50s and 60s across parts of the plains. As we look ahead to Saturday, the flood risk, though, will take shape across parts of the south. Places like Texas stretching into uh, Louisiana. We'll see some heavy the rain there. Nice conditions for the East Coast, a little sunshine and mild conditions there for your Saturday plans. And out West, of course, sunny conditions for folks there. We know how much you love that. April Delight, that's for Savannah. She loves when I say mm -hmm. things like that. So that's what we're looking at when we look ahead to Sunday for much <laughs> of the West. But the stormy conditions stick with us across parts of the Southeast and a little bit of a reality check, Savannah, across the Great Lakes and parts of the Northeast where we'll have a nice cool breeze, a little sunshine, maybe a couple of clouds overhead, uh, but some chillier conditions than what we've so easily gotten used to over the past couple of days here in New York City and across other parts of the Northeast. Absolutely. I do love April Delight. Thank you for I'll that. I'll think idea. of a new one for you tomorrow. Please. I love it. <laughs> Thanks. See you in a bit. All right. We've got a lot more to get to this morning, including the return of the cicadas. The creepy crawly bugs are back for a double dose this year. Oh boy. Listen to that. We'll be previewing the so-called cicada get in. Oh, that's lovely. Just ahead. First though, our exclusive interview with a Boeing engineer turned whistleblower before he heads to Capitol Hill. Why he claims assembly flaws make the 787 Dreamliner unsafe. That's next. Welcome back. Today, Congress will hear allegations from a whistleblower that one of Boeing's most widely flown planes has a serious flaw, which could have devastating consequences. He spoke exclusively with NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello. Tom joins us now with more from Reagan National Airport. Tom, what an interview. Tell us more about what this whistleblower said. He's a current Boeing engineer. Yeah, that's absolutely right. He went to the FAA, raised these concerns. The FAA is now investigating. Today, he is going to Congress to raise these concerns. He's talking about the 787 Dreamliner. This is a plane that has flown hundreds of millions of passengers safely already. But he says it has a very serious flaw that needs to be addressed. If it's not addressed, he claims it could be catastrophic. Boeing says, however, that is completely inaccurate. His allegations are false. It's one of Boeing's best-selling aircraft, transporting 875 million passengers on 1,100 planes worldwide over the past 12 and a half years. But today, a Boeing whistleblower will tell Congress he's concerned that the 787 Dreamliner may have a dangerous flaw. Right now, to me, I see we have real problem in our hand. 15-year Boeing engineer Sam Salapur says the gaps between the big pieces of the fuselage are too big. And even though the fuselage pieces are fastened together, the stress could lead to fatigue failure and disaster after thousands of flights. When the plane can break apart in, in altitude and drop to the ground, I think that's a safety issue. You really think that's what's at stake here? That's exactly what's at stake here. Fatigue failure has no mercy on anybody. But Boeing is pushing back hard, telling NBC News, we are fully confident in the 787 Dreamliner because of the comprehensive work done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate. Since 2020, Boeing has been under FAA supervision as it tightens paper-thin gaps between the fuselage components. 
stress testing the plane through 165,000 takeoffs and landings, more than three times a typical 787's lifespan. Of the 1,100 planes in service, 689 have already gone through various inspections. So far, zero evidence of fatigue. This whistleblower's concerns, while I'm sure are very sincere, I don't think matches what Boeing is saying is happening out in the fleet. Salapur admits he doesn't have full access to all of Boeing's data since he moved off the 787 project in 2022. He claims in retaliation for raising concerns internally. Boeing says it does not tolerate retaliation. Would you put your family on a 787 right now? I would not. Boeing will be in a Senate committee's crosshairs today after two fatal MAX 8 crashes overseas, the MAX 9 door plug blowout, and admitted quality control lapses at Boeing. If we have another crash, I am not sure if Boeing can survive that or not. And that's what I'm trying to prevent. Yeah, Salapur tells me he's coming forward now because he tried for three years to bring this issue up internally within Boeing, but he was not getting a satisfactory response, he says, from Boeing. Boeing, for its part, says it is absolutely convinced and committed to the 787, convinced it is safe after robust testing. Savannah? Tom, it's also interesting to hear you say that he said I, I wasn't really getting anything from them because right now at the same time, Boeing is encouraging employees to speak up if they see anything, right? 100% right. This is called the Boeing Speak Up program. It's literally see something, say something. Boeing has really come forward with this program in a robust way after all of these issues we've been reporting on for months, the quality control breakdowns at Boeing. And Boeing says since they've really been pushing the see something, say something uh, verdict or, or edict, I should say, within Boeing, that employee feedback and tips has have increased 500 percent. So Boeing insists this is working. Employees are speaking up. All right, Tom Costello, important interview. Thank you so much. Well, time now for international headlines. We're going to start with a show of solidarity from Mexico over a police raid on the Mexican embassy in Ecuador. Megan Fitzgerald joins us now with that and more. Hey, Megan. Savannah, good morning. That's right. In a move that's aimed at standing in solidarity with Mexico, Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, closed down his embassy in, uh, and consulate in Ecuador. Maduro is supporting Mexico in its protest over a raid by Ecuadorian authorities on the Mexican embassy in Quito. Now, Ecuador's president said he ordered the raid to arrest Mexico's former vice president, who's a convicted criminal and fugitive. But there's international condemnation because diplomatic grounds are considered foreign soil. And in Indonesia, at least 800 people had to evacuate their homes after a volcano erupted multiple times. Lava has been seen spewing out. Big ash clouds have launched into the sky. Officials on the ground say these eruptions were triggered by recent earthquakes. And despite serving in South Korea's mandatory military service, K-pop superstar Suga now has one of the highest grossing concerts uh, film in 2024. Last year, he got in one last solo concert, which was just released in theaters around the world for a few days. And of course, fans went crazy. Savannah, there is one more year left of this mandatory military service, and I'm quite sure fans are counting down the days. All right, Megan Fitzgerald, thank you so much. Well, it is one of the not-so-pleasant sounds of summer, and this year large parts of the U.S. are set to hear even more noise from cicadas. That is because of a rare double emergence. We're going to learn what that means in a moment, but it is the first in more than 200 years, and it is already starting with the first bugs making their presence heard. NBC's Maggie Vespa is handling this particularly gross, in my opinion, assignment. She joins us from Chicago with the latest. Hey, Maggie, good morning. Hey, Savannah, that's my opinion, too. It's shocking that no one fought me for this assignment here at NBC. So nevertheless, here I am. Uh, they are calling this cicada Geddon. They are calling it the cicada apocalypse with cicada heads, a.k.a. superfans, spotting the first of basically smaller versions of these bugs already on trees and leaves in a couple of states. And that is just the beginning. We are talking about trillions of cicadas crawling out of the ground across the Midwest and South, marking anything bigger than we've seen or heard heard, frankly, in centuries. This morning, the cicadas are coming. There will be a record amount of bugs bursting from the ground in the next few months. And Americans are bracing. There are these massive, loud bugs that fly everywhere. For a double dose of creepy, crawly impact. If I see one, 
I'm not going outside. It's all thanks to a once in a lifetime double emergence with two cicada broods, one that's lived underground for 13 years, the other for 17, crawling out of the soil across the Midwest and South, overlapping in multiple states, including Illinois and Iowa. Some of the first spotted this week in the Carolinas. How many cicadas are we talking? Somewhere in the hundreds of billions to trillions. It's trillions plural. Trillions plural, yes. The last double emergence, 1803, when Thomas Jefferson was president. Anticipation sparking nicknames like Cicada Geddon, with cicada heads launching cicada tracking apps. And in Chicago, painting giant plaster versions for a citywide cicada parade. Why do you want to add more? <laughs> Why wouldn't we? Yeah. Why wouldn't we? Um, so this moment is magical. Some even sharing old viral videos. Have you ever wanted to eat tempura battered cicadas? Of recipes for the uber cicada curious. At Chicago's Field Museum, visitors are buzzing. Do you think that looks cool or is that gross? Um, it looks like both. It looks both? <laughs> Scientists excited to educate people about these winged plant-eating insects with that sound synonymous with the start of summer. Billions of them is kind of like a really big, loud chainsaw. What is billions or trillions going to sound many, like? Many, many chainsaws going at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah, the coolest thing ever. I guess it depends on your take, according to people that we talk to. So uh, I do want to point out, and we were just asked by the control room, this is not anatomically correct, guys. This is a slightly larger version of a cicada. So they're smaller than this, but this is what they look like. Uh, scientists do want us to stress they're completely harmless to humans, and they're mostly good for plants. The only time they can be a problem is if they completely cover, like a really young, small plant that you have, and then you might want to brush it off and cover the plant if you can. Also take heart in knowing they die off after after about a month. So this double emergence will be relatively short lived. It's temporary, but it will be epic. Hence all the merch Savannah that we found online. And that includes like <laughs> rock star style <laughs> no, t-shirts. No, why that are you my wearing producer that? and I already have. We well, I mean just why not? <laughs> Maggie, you might as well call We're yourself a cicada head. It. You're a cicada head, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. We're there, whether we want to be or not. You're at that level. Maggie, uh, terrifying stuff. Thank you very much. All right, coming up, the great elephant escape, the story behind this circus-like scene that played out on the streets of Montana. Neighbors say they will never forget. Stay with us. Welcome back. So we all know about runaway cats or dogs, right? Well, what about something... A lot bigger. Check out this video here of a full-sized elephant from a traveling circus seen roaming the streets of Butte, Montana before she was recaptured. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us with the details on the escape. Sam, what happened here? <laughs> Savannah, you see this video, you're like, no way. Uh-uh, that's not possible. That is not an elephant in the middle of the road. No, yes, it is an elephant in the middle of the road. As far as what happened, there was a traveling circus going through Butte, Montana yesterday. Apparently, Viola, the elephant, managed to shake loose. Now, the circus is not confirming that. But from there, the rest of it, Savannah, was just mayhem in Montana. Elephant. <laughs> There's a certain quality of disbelief. Uh-uh, oh uh-uh, uh-uh that comes with seeing things that don't belong in everyday life. Oh my God. And for residents of Butte, Montana Tuesday, Uncle like Ron, Matea Smith, who was driving with her side. husband, an elephant strolling down the street definitely fit the bill. He was like, oh my gosh, there's an elephant. And I kind of was joking with him and I thought it was in the parking lot. Then he was like, no, there's an elephant. So I looked up and I was like, oh, there is an elephant in the road. The manager of the Civic Center, where the Jordan World Circus was staging, confirming to NBC affiliate KECI, the giant animal apparently got spooked by the sound of a truck backfiring during a bath and bolted. So set the scene for me, right? You see the elephant coming down the street, and then how long after are her handlers also pursuing Viola? I'd say 30 seconds behind her, but the problem is, is that an elephant's much faster than a human. So you see, you see the elephant get into the road, and by the time she's over by the casino, her handlers are just running out as fast as they can. Once Viola popped up on this gas station security camera. My coworker here 
pointed out. Uh, there's an elephant. Started jumping up and down, pointing out the window. And then trotted right by the casino. All bets were off. Witnesses say the whole circus-like scene lasted around 20 minutes before the powerful pachyderm was safely recaptured. Jordan World Circus did not respond to NBC News's request for comment, but their website showed a scheduled stop in Butte the same day as Viola's escape. Now it's a tall tale for a town of 35,000, accustomed to seeing plenty of animals. Typically, you see moose and coyotes, um, lots of bear. But nothing quite like this. I will never forget this. It's not every day you get to see an elephant just wander through your hometown. <laughs> No, it is not. Now, Savannah, the chase ended up outside of someone's apartment complex, according to the local sheriff's office. They said that uh, the circus was able to contain Viola without law enforcement having to get involved. And you know there's that expression that an elephant never forgets. In this case, it's a town that will never forget its elephants. Savannah, back to you. Yeah, I love it, Sam. Your all bets were off. Got a cackle out of me. Thank you very <laughs> much for that. All right, we're just Thank 100 you. days away from the first Summer Olympic Games games in France in a century. Soon athletes from all over the world will gather in the capital for the world's most famous competition. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us now from Paris with more on how the City of Lights is preparing. Keir, good morning. Bonjour, Savannah. It will be summer when the summer comes, I promise you. But look at this uh, spectacular view and imagine it. The opening ceremony on the Seine, 10,500 athletes on 160 boats, uh, th more than 300,000 people lining uh, the banks of, ri of the river for one of the biggest events Paris has ever hosted. This morning, the Olympic flame en route from Greece to Paris. Just 100 days from the City of Light's first Olympics in 100 years. And now a first glimpse of the stunning venues built at some of the city's most famous sites. Oh, my goodness. It's incredible. Under the Eiffel Tower, NBC News showed around the beach volleyball. This is exciting. I mean, to actually see it like this, you get a really, really a feeling for how it's going to be. Yeah, indeed. It is really exciting. You can almost feel the atmosphere of the 13,000 people. The centerpiece set to be the River Seine, hosting the opening ceremony. This week, President Macron saying for the first time that France has backup locations planned if security threats arise. Now, many Olympic locations visible from a riverboat or bateau mouche. My guide, Paris podcaster Oliver G. This is where it's all going to happen. This is the Pont Alexandre Toit, a really famous bridge. Uh, and on both sides, we're going to be having Olympic events. That side and this side? Both. Wow. In total, there are 24 venues scattered in and around Paris, in the Place de la Concorde, skateboarding, and for the first time, breakdancing. At Les Invalides, archery, in the Grand Palais, taekwondo and fencing. While just nine miles outside Paris, the spectacular Chateau de Versailles, home of Louis XIV, who had a passion for horses, will stage the Olympic equestrian event. There will be a beautiful perspective on the Grand Canal and with a backdrop uh, with the Chateau de Versailles. Up to 40,000 spectators will watch competing riders encircle the magnificent golden fountains. Then a different kind of gold. At a French jewellery house, the Paris 2024 medals set with tiny fragments of the Eiffel Tower and encased in bespoke Louis Vuitton trunks. Heightened security means every apartment overlooking events will be searched. Your Parisian apartment. Boston native Susan Godden shows us around her magnificent Paris home. Look at this. Yes. She has volunteered wow. to greet athletes when the games begin. It's such a beautiful city, and I want everyone that comes here to have a wonderful experience and walk away, fall in love with it like I have. Back in Paris, live at Savannah, and the French are set to unveil their outfits for the opening ceremony later today. Tuxedos, tuxedos, I'm told. Très chic, Savannah. Yeah, there we go. And Kier, we saw you jumping in yesterday. Brave of you. Very cool to see. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> All right, coming up, Caitlin Clark fever has swept the nation, but for a woman who made history on the court and is breaking jersey sales records off of it, her WNBA paycheck has many up in arms. We are going to dig into that controversy coming up next. 
Welcome back. The hype over Caitlin Clark in the WNBA is just getting started. Just one hour after she was selected as the number one pick in the draft, Clark's Indiana Fever jersey sold out in nearly every size. Fanatic CEO Michael Rubin said Clark's jersey sold more on draft night than any other athlete in any sport, male or female, in the company's history. But that was quickly overshadowed, I'm sure you saw this all over social media yesterday, by the reveal of Clark's rookie salary contract. Clark will make just over $76,000 in her first year with the league. As for salary, is now sparking an intense debate as the gender pay gap in sports, because that is just a teeny tiny fraction of any of her NBA counterparts. WNBA expert Christina Williams joins us for more on this. Christina, good morning. Good morning. The second you walked in here, I was peppering <laughs> you with questions because I just, it's really hard to wrap your mind around and you help me understand some of it so first just explain the pay structure for the WNBA because I think what a lot of people might not recognize is it's not like oh my gosh the fever is mm -hmm. underpaying her they should have paid her more would another team have given her a better con that's not what's going on here there's there are certain caps set in place based on how this was bargained for all the players so explain that to us yeah so in 2020 there was a brown break brown groundbreaking collective bargaining agreement that the players and the league agreed to and so the salary cap is collectively bargained within that so Every team in the WNBA, they have a hard salary cap with little to no wiggle room. And mm. so as a rookie, she's going to make about $76,000, and that number goes up in her fourth year with a player option. But the difference in revenue sharing between the NBA and the WNBA is based off the limbs of the league. In the NBA, there's 82 games. In the WNBA, there's now 40 games, and it could go up to 44 based off the current CBA. And then also the revenue sharing splits is different between both leagues as well. Explain that, the revenue sharing splits. Yes, yeah, so in the NBA, players can uh, get 50% of the revenue shares, and that's guaranteed money in the NBA. The WNBA, that's not the same. The players can make up to 50% of incremental revenue, and the league describes that as once the league makes a, makes a certain amount of profit in a year, then that, that money trickles down to its players, and they can split it 50-50. But that hasn't happened yet, and so the players are advocating to uh, uh, renegotiate that compensation agreement, and this November they have the option to opt out of the current CBA and renegotiate its terms. Walk us through some of the comparisons that were really just blowing people's mind online yesterday when you kind of put her, you know, I don't know if apples to apples is the right way to put mm -hmm. it when we talk, for example, right here about this comparison, but, you know, just like two first-round draft picks. Tell us about these. Yeah, so I think that the, in a unique situation for Caitlin Clark is she's a part of a group of college athletes who is really benefiting from the NIL era. Oh, yeah. She is making upwards of $3 million according to multiple, multiple reports, and so the 76000 dollars will be in addition to what she's already making in endorsements and mm -hmm. sponsorship money. And yeah, it is a shocking number when you look at the NBA rookies and what they make, but it's two different collective bargaining agreements and uh, the players will have an option to opt out this year. So I guess for people who are like, this, this can't be, no amount of our <laughs> social media outrage or shock can change this, right? I mean, this is this collective bargaining agreement. There's yes. nothing, it's not, even if the Fever wanted to give her millions of dollars, they can't. They can't because this is what the players agreed to in 2020. But again, uh, the players, there was a new documentary that came out called Shattered Glass with the WNBA yeah. and its players. And they talked about what is coming up in, no, in November, that collective bargaining agreement option to opt out. But then next year, the new broadcast media rights deal mm. will also be play a major part in players getting more money uh, in the next collective bargain agreement. So there's a lot of moving parts. The WNBA is also expanding next year, having 13 teams with Golden State Warriors buying into uh, the WNBA. So there's a lot of great things to look forward to. But at the moment, mm. We're out of time, but I do just want to ask, is there, is Caitlin Clark's specific, extremely high star power, I mean, what we mentioned about her jersey selling out, could that help the entire league? I mean, could this focus on women's sports that she, honestly, in a lot of ways, single-handedly is doing a lot for, make this better for all players? Yeah, when we talk about equity, it starts with putting these players like Caitlin Clark in the spotlight to drive mm. more sports coverage, but yeah. also to increase the valuation when we talk about negotiating that new media's rights deal next year as totally. well. So much to watch for. We'll keep talking to you about it. Christina Williams, thank you so much. Great to have you here. Well, let's get you to some financial headlines. U.S. lawmakers are scrutinizing a newly proposed sports streaming joint venture. Bertha Coombs back with us this hour. Hey, Bertha, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Yeah, that's right. Lawmakers are raising concerns about that new sports streaming venture planned by Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery. Congressman Jerry Nadler and Joaquin... 
Castro sent a letter to the CEOs of the companies questioning how the offering will affect competition and viewer choices. They're concerned that it's going to result in higher prices and unfair licensing terms for sports leagues and video distributors. The sports ventures already facing an antitrust battle filed by Fubo TV. Amazon Music, meantime, is joining Spotify in rolling out a generative AI playlist feature because everything has to be generative AI. Amazon's tool is called Maestro. It's uh, only available to a small number of users right now. It's designed to use natural language prompts to create any type of playlist, including sounds, activities, emotions, they say, and even emojis. I don't know how you tell a sound thing to do an emoji, but uh, whatever. Since it's still in beta test, Amazon says Maestro may not get everything right immediately, and it has put safeguards in place to prohibit offensive language and inappropriate prompts. Meantime, Sesame Street may be forced to turn the lights out. Writers employed by the show's producer, Sesame Workshop, have voted to authorize a strike. Their current contract expires on Friday. The three dozen writers have been in talks since February and could start picketing next week. New episodes of Sesame Street air on Max, but the show's fate for next year and beyond is uncertain. Mm. I guess they might have to do That's a segment news. on, you know, Collective bargaining, talk about the we NBA. We got a lot of collective WNBA bargaining conversation Street, this morning. Right? It's so true. It's certainly of interest. Bertha Coombs, thank you so much. Well, this morning, Time is out with its list of the 100 most influential people. So who made the cut? We're going to sit down with Time's deputy editor up next. Welcome back and happy Wednesday, especially for fans of the Addams Family's favorite daughter. The hit Netflix show Wednesday is getting a fun addition to its cast. Variety reports that actor Steve Buscemi is joining star Jenna Ortega for the upcoming second season of the spinoff series. You might know him from numerous Adam Sandler movies or even an episode of The Sopranos. So far, no word on Buscemi's role in the show, but I think it's safe to say fans of the supernatural mystery are dying. Ha ha to see their new adventures at Nevermore Academy. All right, here's a question for you. Are you the youngest sibling, the middle child, maybe the oldest? Well, how your birth order can shape who you are is the subject of a recent New York Times article and also some social media posts that are lighting up with some strong feelings about what it has to say about eldest daughters, of which I am one. Here's today's co-host, Hoda Kotb. Birth order is something that has been discussed and dissected for decades. Alfred Adler developed birth order theory. But thanks to what some say are spot-on takes on eldest daughters on social media, first-born girls are having a moment. If you know an oldest daughter or an oldest sibling, give them a hug and say thank you. A New York Times article entitled Why Your Big Sister Resents You has eldest sisters and their loved ones buzzing, citing viral content like this post on X asking, are you happy or are you the oldest sibling and also a girl? The comment section becoming something of a support group. Eldest daughter syndrome is not an official mental health diagnosis. It's a term coined to describe the unique pressures and responsibilities placed onto the oldest daughter in the family. In short, this TikTok video from Katie Morton, a licensed marriage and family therapist and youngest sibling, has been viewed more than six and a half million times. One, you have an intense feeling of responsibility. Two, you are an overachiever, type A and very driven. The topic has been discussed at length on podcasts. We're definitely what I call like bonus parents. Family therapist Sarah Stanizai has had an overwhelming response to a support group she created for fellow oldest daughters. When you're in a room of people who absolutely understand it, even though they might have their own sort of nuances to it, hearing each other's stories and also being heard, what that's really telling you is you're not abnormal. Middle children are often described as having big personalities, the youngest outgoing and social. The research on birth order personality traits is mixed. Experts say it may not matter. If it matters to you, then it matters. Our thanks to Hoda for that story. Such an interesting one. I think we have a picture of my sister and I, because again, I am the eldest. This is my, oh 
Oh, there's my dad, too. He watches every morning, so he'll see this. That's my younger sister, Riley, who I most certainly do not resent, but I do understand the conversation around feeling like <laughs> sometimes you're the glue of the family. We'll see if they agree with that. Anyway, finally this hour, Time just released their list of the 100 most influential people this year. And as you're about to see, there are some big names on the list. Kelly Conniff is Time's deputy editor. She's back with us to go over this list. Kelly, always great to have you in studio. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So first, let's just start with who's on the list. I know it's not a ranking, right? Exactly. It's like yeah. 100 influential people, right. but you do have four covers in particular. But tell us about who's on this list. Sure. So, you know, this is our annual list of the people who we think have really shaped the last year. This year, we have a number of great people on the list. I think one of the standouts, of course, is Yulia Navalny, mm -hmm. who is the widow of Alexei Navalny, the anti-Putin dissident who died mm -hmm. in a Russian prison camp earlier this year. Uh, she gave us her first interview since his death. He just died a few months ago. Um, she's really stepping into a role as kind of a, a leader of the mm. movement that he started. She was often in the background. She was always there, but she was never really front and center, and she's really taken on that mantle. It's kind of an incredible thing to really think about doing just a few months after your spouse dying. And um, she, we went to Lithuania to talk with her. That's where the movement is, is kind of located. And we spent a lot of time with her, and, and she mm. really gave us a lot, which was wonderful. Um, we also have uh, Dua Lipa, um, who has not listened to a Dua Lipa song in the last <laughs> few months. She's everywhere. She, of course, has a new album coming out in just a few weeks. So exciting. Um, we talked to her as well about growing up in Kosovo. She had a lot to say about that, uh, about her new music, how she's trying to change her sound. Uh, we also have, of course, Patrick Mahomes, our you know reigning Super Bowl champ. Uh, this is his third time on the list. He's only 28 years old, which is really incredible to think about. Um, makes you think about your life choices, right? Oh, gosh, I hate um, when you realize that. I, I know. Du <laughs> Dua Lipa is 28, too. So it's really just kind of kind of crazy to what think. What have I done in my life? Yeah. yeah but, you know, he, he seemed, we, we sat down with him in Dallas. He's, he's a really thoughtful, nice, humble mm. guy. Um, you know, we, we went to him and said, look, you're hitting numbers that people haven't hit until much later in, in their career. And he said, look, I'm just focusing on, like, my life, my family, doing what I can moving forward. Um, and then our fourth cover, of course, is Taraji P. Hansen, who is an icon and a mm. legend. We've had her on the list before. And with her, we're recognizing a type of influence of someone who's been there. She's been doing the work. She's been mm. incredible for years. But this is really with her role in The Color Purple last year, her speaking up about pay inequity, specifically with black women in Hollywood. Um, it's, it's her moment. And we wanted to really put her on the cover, put what she's saying front and center. We only have about a minute, but one of my favorite things about this particular list is that you have other very famous people typically writing about these people, giving them this honor, like Maren Morris for Jack Antonoff, for right. example, which is so cool to get to hear a little bit from somebody else who's super famous and not about themselves, right? Talking about somebody else. What's that process like? Absolutely. So we spend a lot of time on this mm. part of the list. We do a lot of brainstorming. We do a lot of gut checks. We're, we're always kind of throwing back and forth names. Um, you know, this happens in different ways. Sometimes it's people who you can tell are really friends. Mm. We have a Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants reunion, yes. Blake Lively and America Ferrara. Uh, we have a Skins reunion, uh, Daniel Kaluuya on Dev Patel. Uh, mm. You can tell there's real warmth in these. It's really nice. Uh, sometimes you have people who clearly admire someone and are, are inspired. Uh, Tarana Burke, founder of the uh, mm. Me Too movement on E. Jean Carroll, a really poignant piece. Uh, we also have Ryan Reynolds on Michael J. Fox, mm. another moment where you can tell he really admires someone. Sometimes you have people who are colleagues, people who want to work together. We have Joe Biden on UAW President Sean Fain. Mm. So there's really a lot of variety, but we're, yeah. we're looking for something that will pop. We're looking for something that will be meaningful. And what a feat to book, both the winners and the people uh, who are writing. Absolutely. It's, it's amazing. Project. Kelly Connor, thank you so much. We love thank when you, you come by. We appreciate you being here. And that 2024 Time 100 list available now. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now, but the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.